welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. We're really excited to have you here with us. We have a really interesting guest today and a very, very important topic. And in, in I'm going to say, Stacey J, almost like a history lesson um, in where we've been and where we're going. Stacey J um, Cavalier, Executive Director of Aunt Rita's Foundation, is going to join us and talk to us about HIV and AIDS, the work that Aunt Rita's Foundation does. You've been in our community forever since I can remember. And um, you and I were at an event and kind of, uh, you know, you came, I think I came up to you or something. And I, we were, I was like, Aunt Rita's Foundation, I love their work. And then you're like, well, I'm the ED. And so we started chit chatting and I'm just thrilled to get you on an episode of the nonprofit show, Stacey J. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be here. Well, it's going to be a, a really interesting conversation and one that um, we desperately need to reframe. And so this is going to be really, really interesting. You know, at the Nonprofit Show, we have an amazing assortment of co-hosts. I'm flying solo today because we're going into a holiday, um, but hopefully you've been able to meet them as we have been introducing them over the last couple of months. They are from across the country. They're incredibly diverse doing different things in the nonprofit sector. So it's really exciting to bring this group of people along uh, to each edition of the nonprofit show. We also want to thank all of our presenting sponsors, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. Okay, Stacey J, coming to us as the Executive Director of Aunt Rita's Foundation, Whew, that's a big job, my friend, if, if no one told you that. <laughs> yes, uh, it is a big job, uh, but I'm just so honored to uh, be uh, leading this organization with my a great team of staff, my fantastic board of directors, and uh, mm -hmm. hundreds of volunteers that work with me every day. So thank yeah. you again for having me. How long have you been the executive director? I've been in my current role uh, almost a year and a half now, uh, so I'm uh, more of a newbie to the staff, but uh, I have been engaged with Aunt Rita's um, uh, since the start of my HIV journey. Uh, Aunt Rita's was the first phone call I made when uh, I was diagnosed HIV positive uh, 22 years ago. So it's a um, full circle moment. Um, uh, not only have uh, I received the resources that Aunt Rita's provides, but now I can in turn give that back to the community. Yeah. You know, I think there's nothing more powerful in our sector is when we get a client that goes into leadership. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have that enough. Um, but I just love it when I hear this. And I, I just think that it's so profound and it must really change the trajectory of your leadership and how you lead. Right. I mean, does that seem possible? It does. Yeah, that does resonate with me. You know, um, uh, my goal and our goal at Aunt Rita's is just to get the word out to um, anyone and everyone seeking support and needing support. Uh, you know, uh, um, I benefited greatly from the resources. And so uh, mm -hmm. I feel like uh, it is my duty now to give that back, uh, yeah. back to others um, and really to lift up those most marginalized and most affected. Mm -hmm. I love it. Super powerful. I feel like we could end this episode right now because you've already inspired me and we haven't even started talking, <laughs> but I'm not going to let you off the hook because we got a lot to talk about. Let's so let's go back and, and talk about this journey of Aunt Rita's foundation and, and what it was and what it is now. We'll be talking more about that, but paint a picture for us about what things were like and, and why you were formed. Yeah, so Aunt Rita's was formed uh, in 1988 uh, at the height of the beginning of the F um, HIV epidemic when there was very little uh, attention around uh, the virus um, and the spread and the increasing infections, um, particularly among uh, gay men at that time. Um, the government was not talking about it. The media, uh, if they were talking about it, was not uh, in the most positive light. So three courageous group um, members of the Phoenix community came together uh, uh, because they saw the need of their friends and family who were um, who were suffering and unfortunately back then dying of AIDS. Wow. Um, so uh, they rallied together uh, and at a local gay bar, they introduced our very first bake sale 
They raised over five thousand dollars in 1988 at that first bake sale, uh, which was <laughs> extraordinary. Uh, and yeah, those funds uh, were used uh, to support people uh, for their rent. Uh, for their medication costs. And unfortunately at that time, some funeral costs as well. Um, uh, they continued to fundraise um, uh, at local bars and local events and uh, 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 continued that grassroots community collective um, through 2005 when we were uh, uh, um, officially received our 501c3 nonprofit status. Where did the name Aunt Rita come from? Yeah, uh, so that's a tale that has been passed down. Uh, <laughs> That's what I had to ask. Yeah, so various iterations of that, but uh, long story short, uh, one of the uh, folks who are our co-founders, uh, Tish Tanner, was a local drag queen, um, uh, um, 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 a drag celebrity, if you will, back in that time. And uh, she uh, nicknamed all of the other drag performers that did those fundraisers uh, at those bake sales and whatnot, um, um, Aunt Rita. So they were our Rita. So anyone now, you know, who works with us, uh, who really advocates out there for our mission is a Rita themselves. So we all have a little bit of Aunt Rita's in the, um, in our hearts for the work that we do. I love it. Well, you know, in our community, um, with, you know, the Margarita being pretty much our industrial, you know, our, our standard beverage, <laughs> adult beverage of choice, you know, there's so many Rita kind of things that are out there. And so, there That's are, it. yeah, we can really brand our name pretty well, pretty creative. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I just think that's great. Now, help me out again. You you started fundraising. It's 1988. You're doing this with a very select community. Um, and then if you go all the way to 2005 before you get your 501c3 status, in those early days, it was still pretty hard to get that 501c3 status, right? It probably took you all quite a while to get that formed, right? Yeah, you know, I don't know much about uh, the history uh, of that particular uh, acquisition, but um, I can say, yes, uh, it is not easy to start a nonprofit. Uh, and back then, you know, uh, with the little resources that were out there for this community, you know, um, um, I just thank those who uh, I stand on their shoulders for really, you know, uh, yeah. pushing us to the forefront. Um, uh, in 2005, 2006 is when uh, more state and federal funding started uh, coming down the pipes. Um, um, Aunt Rita's was one of the first uh, agencies in Arizona to receive uh, national funding for HIV work. Uh, so, you know, uh, we're just trying to continue that legacy and just uh, push ahead to meet the national and our state goals to end the epidemic. Wow, amazing. So talk about then, you know, you painted this picture in 1988, how things were going. Talk about how your organization has changed due to social factors, science, education. What does all this look like? Yeah, well, I'll start out with the good news. Uh, the good news is uh, there have been uh, um, great advancements in medication, uh, treatment, and outreach and education. Uh, you know, uh, with the um, ever, uh, um, um, ever changing needs of pharmaceutical companies um, and the medications that treat HIV, uh, you know, uh, when we started out, uh, those medications were extremely rough on the body. Uh, mm -hmm. They weren't um, um, as tested as well. There wasn't a lot of clinical trials or um, um, long-term outcomes with the folks who were taking an anti-retroviral uh, uh, medications. Um, but now uh, we're at the point where we have really good products on the market uh, to mm -hmm. treat and test. Um, and so, you know, uh, we're just pushing ahead to uh, spread that messaging, uh, get people educated, uh, get people tested and uh, get people treated if needed. Mm -hmm. Do you find that um, now, I have so many questions, Stacey mm -hmm. Jay, let me back up. When you first started, I can't imagine that you had a lot of allies and that you had a lot of uh, different types of people and populations in your community willing to stand up or to even think that they could support you. How does that, how did that look versus now? Yeah, you know, um, when we first started doing our work back in 1988 and through the uh, early 2000s, um, it was pretty much looked um, as, as, a, uh, um, as a gay virus, as a gay disease. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, the uh, gay community really rallied around this cause because it was those of us that identify within that community that were, yeah greatly affected. Um, 
but by reaching out to our um, um, allies, uh, uh, the lesbian community really stepped up to support uh, their brothers uh, and uh, communities of color actually too uh, um, um, came out in large amounts. You know, uh, there was a lot of intersectional work in the early days of the HIV movement um, with communities of color, other marginalized communities, um, reproductive health um, mm -hmm. organizations. So, you know, uh, just continuing to just uh, educate people, uh, engage people and really find the common ground of, you know, um, the work that uh, we continue to do uh, mm -hmm. together to reach most people. Right. Now, when you started, I've got to believe you were just kind of a little local group. How have you navigated to more of a national organization or being engaged in policy and deep thought leadership on this, you know, health topic, social topic, all, all of those things? What does that change look like? Yeah, well, uh, when Aunt Rita uh, first started to get uh, some of that federal funding that was coming out, uh, um, you know, uh, that really kind of uh, pushed us forward uh, um, as being the uh, connector of the HIV community. Uh, that is what Aunt Rita's has been known for since our inception. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, reintroduced uh, AIDS Walk Arizona, our largest fundraiser and um, outreach event of the year uh, uh, since 2006. Uh, each year we uh, host around 1,000 uh, to 1,500 people uh, every year who come out um, to... Um, advocate for the cause um, and raise funds for our partner agencies that we fund through our grants program. Um, and uh, that program really uh, extends our reach throughout the state of Arizona. Um, each year we put out an RFP for our grants program. Any, um, any nonprofit in the state of Arizona can apply and then all the net proceeds from our annual AIDS Walk event are equally distributed to those partner agencies each year, um, furthering our reach. Uh, and then we also have our own, you know, uh, direct service programs and HIV testing and education programs in house as well. So, each year um, uh, uh, we reach over forty thousand people through our partner agencies' reach and our own programs. So, um, you know, once again, uh, uh, getting out there, uh, establishing those unique strategic partnerships, um, also outside of the HIV space. Uh, you know, uh, working with um, other healthcare clinics who don't particularly. Um, advertise themselves as an HIV clinic, but um, um, educating them that it is a part of just your holistic health care. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, um, partnering with other marginalized groups um, who serve, you know, those priority populations that are disproportionately affected by HIV. Mm -hmm. Do you find that given that you're now, it's amazing to me to think in a short period of time, you go from a small group having bake sales to being a funder, a statewide funder. Do you find that these groups in, you know, throughout your state are doing the same thing or like what is the climate or the temperature of that work that you're seeing? Yeah, well, um, I'll start with some facts here. Uh, uh, there are currently over 19,000 individuals um, in Arizona living with HIV. So uh, we know that there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, luckily, 79% uh, of those folks um, living with HIV in the state um, um, have been linked to care within 90 days of their diagnosis. Um, but we are seeing a little bit of drop um, of folks um, retaining that care. So uh, that's why it takes um, healthcare clinics, um, uh, needle exchange organizations, um, organizations like Aunt Rita that, you know, have. Uh, resources and referral programs to uh, get people tested, treated if needed, and uh, continual education about how they can stay healthy. Mm -hmm. When you talk about education, how are you doing advocacy work and education to the general public who thinks, oh, this has gone away, this isn't an issue? Yeah, uh, that is still uh, probably one of the biggest pieces of stigma um, associated with HIV is that you know, um, it's not a problem anymore. Um, I can't catch it, you know, all of those things. Right. Um, right. But um, um, how we spread that word uh, uh, is through our strategic partnerships, like I just mentioned, but also by really going to um, um, any setting that will have us. And if they at first don't want to have us, we keep knocking on that door and making yeah. phone calls. Uh, we, uh, um, our readers recently, uh, um, uh, in partnership with Spectrum Medical, one of our partners, um, engaged the uh, Greater Phoenix Chapter of the Black Nurses Association. We had a uh, train-the-trainer program where 
Aunt Rita's um, gave the education to over 15 um, of the chapter nurses who work in the field and some who are retired who just volunteer their time. Um, and then they took that information, that education and some um, HIV self test kits out to uh, black faith based uh, institutions all over the valley uh, to further that reach. And uh, they reached through that trainer train the trainer program over 400 individuals. And we're going to continue that partnership and bring Spectrum Medical in to continue those conversations with routine health screenings, HIV, STI testing. Amazing. You know, that's really uh, creative. I love uh, that you have had to kind of think of new things and, and flex your muscles in a different way. Because what I find so fascinating about talking with you, Stacey J, is that you're in the middle of tremendous change, right? I mean, it's the climate is changing, um, the the science is changing. Mm-hmm. Um, it is amazing to me in my lifetime that I would see um, the commercial aspect of HIV um, mm-hmm. and AIDS being uh, um, marketed, right? That and, and not by just one company, but that right. there are different products and that, you know, it's, uh, it, I don't know, it just seems fascinating and and really uh, almost perilous because when I watch those ads and they're frequent, um, it seems like this problem's gone away. You just need to take a pill. Yeah, you know, and while, <clears throat> while we have all the tools now that we need, um, you know, uh, it's a uh, it's a multi pronged approach to uh, diagnose people to get their testing, whether it's a um, at home test in a laboratory setting in a clinical healthcare setting, um, particularly to those communities who um, where the stigma uh, is a little bit higher, um, the education you know isn't quite there, um, but um, also those marginalized communities who oftentimes don't have access to transportation or for co-pay. So um, there's a lot of resources, you know, uh, that are still needed, all the more important to continue uh, the funding from the federal and the state level, um, but also uh, to uh, prevent. So education, continuing education, um, lifting people up uh, to tell their stories about living with HIV or how they prevent HIV, and then uh, to get people uh, treated who do um, test positive, and then really responding to uh, continuing uh, to respond to the education and the data that we have to really inform our outreach strategies, our testing strategies, and our treatment strategies. Mm-hmm. Because it's changing, and I've got to believe that it's um, it's incredibly rapid. It's a rapid change, it seems to me. I don't know. I mean, you're in the trenches. Maybe it doesn't seem like that to you, but um, you know the speed with which things are moving and and uh, going on. I got to ask you this question. Um, because you've mentioned it, and it's fascinating to me. How do you build these relationships with other nonprofits, and how are you securing this additional, I would say, marriage or union of advocacy? Yeah, you know, um, I think our rich legacy of uh, being a trusted organization, uh, 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 the leaders who have come before me, um, uh, Glenn Henry Spencer was one uh, of our uh, executive directors who really, really uh, changed the course of uh, um, what Aunt Rita's, um has done uh, with our HIV self-test kit program, um, with joining um, the efforts to uh, um, um, make Phoenix a uh, fast-track cities, which uh, really puts more of a spotlight on the HIV epidemic with our uh, city council f- folks in Phoenix. Um, 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 I have the pleasure of sitting on the ad hoc committee for the fast track city. So, you know, we fund wow. programs, uh, we fund um, uh, um, um, marketing uh, um, events and uh, public service announcements on the radio and TV uh, with uh, the city council's um, involvement. So, you know, um, really a uh, long story short, um, um, any way that we can, uh, any platform that we can come on uh, like this one, for example, uh, is how we do this work. It's interesting. So th- this is part of a strategic uh, approach then, it seems like, to being, you know, uniting and not just standing on your own, right? Yep, um, indeed. You know, uh, while uh, um, HIV uh, was and still is um, oftentimes looked as, you know, as a as a gay virus, as a gay mm-hmm. um, uh, situation, uh, the facts tell otherwise. Um, while mm-hmm. the most commonly reported population um, um, of folks uh, greatest at risk of transmission of HIV is still the men who have sex with men. Um, 
there are um, many other priority populations that the Centers of Disease Control are looking at that we need to reach as well, which include uh, Black women, particularly um, older Black women, um, transgender women who have sex with men, um, youth age 13 through 24, and people who inject drugs. So, um, you know, uh, uh, it takes a collective community. It takes all of our voices. Um, the CDC uh, does recommend um, anyone between the ages of 13 and 65 who are sexually active or inject drugs um, get an HIV test on an annual basis. So, you know, exactly. uh, we need to follow the advice um, of science. We need to continue to have these conversations and normalize sexual health as part of our holistic health care. Right, right. Well, just talking about it. I mean, I, I was in college when this really came out and and the number of my friends who lost, you know, cousins and, and uncles to this horrible disease that never disclosed it to the other family members because of shame or or, you know, the, the family dynamic. And now today where you and I are having this conversation. Right. I mean, it, it's like what a trajectory um, of change. And then you layer in science when I think about how when this was launched, um, you know, the federal government would not touch it. Yep. The administration at the time would not discuss it. They wouldn't use the words. Um, wow. I mean, yeah. What an, an incredible um, story. And, and I'm wondering about the, the story in terms of like the future, because the story's not over. Get out your crystal ball. Yep. <laughs> what well, does the next 10 years look like? Yeah. Uh, so the 10 uh, next years uh, for Aunt Rita's um, and the HIV community uh, look uh, uh, look pretty positive if we use those multifaceted approaches and if we work together. Um, uh, uh, in addition to, you know, um, implementing um, 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 a status neutral approach to care, which means uh, retaining people in care, continuing to have those conversations regardless of HIV status, um, we can really effectively uh, reach the national goals uh, to eliminate the epidemic by 2030. And what that means, um, we have a, um, a few national goals that we're trying to reach on the local, state, and national level, uh, uh, the 95, 95, 95 targets, which mean 95% um, of people with living, living with HIV should uh, be diagnosed. 95% uh, of those those who are diagnosed should be receiving treatment, and then 95 of all those receiving treatment should achieve, achieve viral suppression, which means that the viral load of HIV is so low in the body that a test can't detect it, thus um, uh, being an undetectable viral load uh, with medications, you can live a long, healthy, normal life. And, and Stacey J, 95, 95, 95, the target date for that, help me out again? 2030. 2030, okay. Yeah. so. That's a very short period of time. It is. Two questions. When was that goal set? Like how, how long have you been working that goal? Yeah, so uh, it used to be 90, 90, 90, uh, and we didn't quite achieve those targets uh, a few years ago. So now we pushed the goalpost um, to that 95, 95, uh, 95 goals. Uh, 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 we're challenging ourselves, but again, we have all the tools, we have all, um, all the things that we need. Uh, we just have to work together and go out there and do it and uh, reduce the stigma. Uh, that's our biggest barrier, I think, now is just reducing the stigma, having these conversations and normalizing HIV conversations. Right. Now, you're a young man. What's going to happen to your organization if you achieve those goals? Um, doesn't look like your organization is just going to fold its tent, right? It won't. No, um, I would be remiss not to mention um, our long term long-term survivor community and our HIV aging population. Uh, Aunt Readers has a program called Experience Escapades who engages those living with HIV over the age of 50 years old. Um, to uh, uh, We uh, did a study with ASU back in 2018 that identified um, uh, that social isolation, um, um, loneliness, and lack of access to additional resources um, were uh, a big factor among those uh, over the age of 50 living with HIV. So we started this program, Experience Escapades. We bring the group together um, each month and do a fun social um, activity, whether it's taking them to the theater or sports games or having community dinners here in our office. Um, and through those conversations, through those events, we um, identify uh, from our participants what additional resources that they need so then we can connect them uh, the next day uh, um, or after those groups. Uh, we also offer for that group um, a monthly yoga and uh, wellness uh, sessions as well. 
Um, so uh, um, uplifting those who have been living with uh, um, HIV for a long time and the HIV aging community, which comes with, um, you know, um, not only the normal um, health related things that um, um, are worth aging, but then uh, their HIV, you know, uh, is compounded from that. Uh, you know, these are the folks who were taking those early medications that, you know, pretty much destroyed their bodies. So there are also other co-occurring issues happening with the aging community. So uh, continuing to uplift them, um, telling their stories about what it was like in the early days uh, and uh, connecting them to the young people to um, educate so that the young people know how important this still is. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating, uh, this change and to be talking about this. I mean, from 1988, um, what, um, you know, America was like, what the world was like. Um, if you just step back and you think about technology, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just how we have had to rethink the nonprofit sector and how we communicate, how we do outreach, mm -hmm. how we educate um, our constituents and donors and stakeholders. It's fascinating. It, it seems to me like you've had to really be on your toes and yet deal with this, this uh, health crisis at the same time. Yeah, you know, and we have to uh, stay on our toes every day, you know, with, uh, with uh, social media and all of the different platforms to get messages out. And then unfortunately, the misinformation that's out there too, you know, uh, just uh, continuing to just uh, um, um, have consistent messaging to uh, different groups. And the messaging yeah. is different, you know, uh, for different uh, populations and for different um, age groups and demographics. So, you know, we have to keep up on those trends. And that's why we look to um, our partner agencies that we fund and our other community partners and our funders too, to really inform us of um, um, how we can most effectively work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. Well, I have really enjoyed, you know, reconnecting with Aunt Rita's. Um, you have done amazing, amazing work in our community and the generations of people that have been with Aunt Rita's um, really pioneers in, in the discussion of HIV AIDS um, and then looking at outreach in a different way to a community that um, wasn't nor wasn't a, a logical choice in the beginning, yeah. right? You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like, this is what we're going to do. You know, I think it would have been so easy for Aunt Rita's to stay in the shadow and insulate themselves with their population that they felt comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, we uh, our goal remains the same uh, that it was in 1988. Uh, we uh, support and serve uh, those most affected by HIV. And as the years go by, uh, those priority populations change. Uh, but we remain steadfast in our mission to end the um, HIV epidemic. Yeah, amazing. Well, you have been a real gift. And um, I look forward to seeing you out and about and other things. Um, throughout our community. That's one of the great blessings of my life is that I get to actually see you in real life out there um, doing your work. And so really cool. Stacey J. Um, Cavalier, Executive Director of Aunt Rita's Foundation. Check out AuntRita's.org and you can learn more about their work. They have some amazing testimonials about um, what it was like in the, the late 80s as the organization was started and the different champions that they've had uh, with their organization. It's it's really inspiring. You can also see images and learn about their events to get some ideas that maybe you can do in your community or better yet, travel to our community and participate because there are some amazing things that Aunt Rita uh, does. Another amazing group that I'm privileged to work with day in and day out are our sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that allow us to have amazing leaders like Stacey J um, on the nonprofit show. On the nonprofit show. So thank you, thank you very much. Stacey J, we end every episode with this mantra, and we have now for more than 1,100 shows, five years. Um, it means something to me virtually every day that I say it, but today it really strikes a different chord. Um, and the saying goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thank you so much, Stacey J. We'll see you again. Thank you, everyone.